Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me in the back? Fantastic. If that changes, please signal and let me know. So I'm Brian. I'm an addiction psychiatrist, and I'm uh, honored to be here at the School of Dentistry. Um, this is the first time I've been uh, given the opportunity to speak in front of this audience. And so before I jump into the talk, um, how many of the people in the room have finished their training and are practicing dentistry? All right, cool, handful. How many are um, uh, dental fellows? Any, any dental residents? Okay. And um, any dental students? Awesome, welcome. And um, anyone that's not in dentistry? Oh, yes. Nursing? Yes. Any, any physicians here? Okay, cool. So, uh, so I'm an addiction psychiatrist, and I am coming to pain management, let me be very clear, as someone who is not a dentist. So it is very easy for me to sit here and opine on what others do that I don't necessarily have to take responsibility for. That being said, as an addiction psychiatrist, I work with people that have ran into problems with pain medications and have some ideas uh, that I think are informed by the literature. And you know, as we go through, I'm happy to cite my sources that I think promote an evidence-based way of managing pain in a way that reduces and mitigates the risk of substance use disorders. So that's what I'm gonna present here today. This is part of a two-part series. So I'm here uh, this Friday afternoon and I'll be here next Friday afternoon. This Friday afternoon is really about judicious pain management. N uh, next Friday afternoon is what do you do about identifying and when it's identified that somebody has an opioid use disorder or another type of substance use disorder about the implications of those um, conditions to dental practice. So we'll talk a little bit about opioid use disorder and other substance use disorders here today, but that's not going to be the focus of this talk. That will be the focus of next week's talk. And this presentation is funded uh, through uh, federal money that came to California in something called the State Targeted Response. The State Targeted Response Technical Assistance Program provides money for talks like this, and if any of you in wherever you work are interested in additional technical assistance or programming related towards uh, the opioid crisis in the United States, the um, uh, State Targeted Response Technical Assistance Program is interested in helping participate with that. It organizes local expertise and communities and organizations to address the opioid public health crisis, and this is the uh, website, the email, and the phone number that you can call. Okay, so with those caveats out of the way, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. I am not on any speaker panels. I don't get any money from any pharmaceutical companies. I am uh, unfortunately free of conflicts. And, uh, um, uh, and so the agenda that, that I have for the next, I don't know, maybe hour and a half together are to talk about dental pain in pediatric patients, to talk about both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic approaches to, pedi to treating pediatric dental pain, to distinguish appropriate versus inappropriate opioid pharmacotherapy, and to talk about judicious opioid pharmacotherapy, that is, um, when you are prescribing that you're following all applicable sort of laws and parameters, which I will say as of January 1st are very rapidly changing. There's a lot of new regulations coming out. I'm gonna touch on some of them, but also want to point you in the resources of where you can go to make sure that you're up to date on the current uh, policies, uh, state policies uh, that address a controlled substance prescribing. And then talk about alternatives to opiate pharmacotherapy when opioid pharmacotherapy isn't appropriate or isn't working. Um, I'll start off just with a terminology slide. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics in their journal Pediatrics defines pediatrics along certain age ranges. So infancy is between birth and age two, childhood is between age of two and 12, and adolescence between 12 and 21. I know in the Los Angeles County system, which is where I work, uh, we consider transitional age youth up to age 25. For most dentists, as I understand, pediatrics is somewhere and somewhere around 16 to 18, de kind of depending on the population. So I just wanted to be clear about terminology-wise who I'm talking about is infants, childhood, and adolescents really up until page, uh, page till age 21, with the caveat that uh, there's different systems of care that have slightly different definitions. Um, so pain assessments are integral to dental history and a comprehensive evaluation that even when oral, facial, and dental pain signs and symptoms are evident, that to conduct a detailed pain assessment is appropriate, and that dentists derive a clinical diagnosis, prioritize a treatment plan, and estimate analgesic requirements that's individualized to the patient. So it's not that every molar extraction gets this number of oxycodone, or not that, um, say, uh, every implant insertion gets X number of, say, hydrocodone or something like that, that 
depending on the patient that's in front of you, the, the pain regimen is tailored. And so there's the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry Policy Statement that I'm not going to read all of these words other than to point out that pain assessment's important and to when you're prescribing medications for pain, to consider um, uh, non-opioid analgesics first-line agents and if you're going to use opioids to combine them with non-opioid uh, pain agents for pain control because that can decrease overall opioid consumption. And then, uh, you know, this statements are on additional research in, in um, pain in pediatric populations. So acute dental pain is the normal predicted physiologic response to a chemical, thermal, or mechanical stimulus associated with surgery, trauma, or acute illness. And it is influenced by attitudes, beliefs, and personalities. So that's one of the things around you know, people have anatomy in their mouths, but that anatomy in their mouths is surrounded by a person that is in a context, right? And that person has culturally normative sort of beliefs and understandings and expectations where one person might have a minor procedure and can report sort of extreme pain. And that may be culturally normative for them. Might, that might be their way of sort of expressing themselves, um, where somebody might go through an extremely painful procedure and report very little pain. So pain is culturally bound is essentially what I'm saying. And not all patients experience pain in the same way. Factors that increase painful experiences included disrupted family systems, anxiety and depression, not getting enough sleep, and substance use disorders. One of the tragedies of having an opioid use disorder is that people that tend to have uh, use opioids in a disordered way also tend to experience pain more intensely. When I say, wh when, when you take people and you look at physiologic responses to pain, somebody's physiologic response to pain when they have an opioid use disorder is higher for the same stimulus than somebody without an opioid use disorder. So ironically, people with opioid use disorders need like very, like almost super adequate analgesia, but the thing, that the tools that oftentimes we use to generate pain relief, which are opioids, are relatively contraindicated. Not absolutely, but relatively contraindicated in people that, that have a history of a use disorder and may not use them appropriately. So it is important to treat pain even in people with disrupted family systems, and anxiety, depression, sleep disruption, and substance use disorders. Um, these are, so there's a number of studies looking at medications for pain, and uh, this I pulled from a uh, webinar that you can access from Dan Alford and uh, this uh, Dr. Figueroa around safe opiate prescribing for dental pain. Um, so when you look at what, uh, what is the number needed to treat in order to get half the anal uh, uh, pain relief by 50%, so not pain free, but how to significantly put a dent in somebody's pain to achieve cl clinically significant analgesia. We see the combination of ibuprofen and acetaminophen um, is actually pretty high, highly efficacious. You need to treat 1.6 patients to get a 50% response rate in, in uh, people's pain score. Naproxen, 1.8. So then when you get to opioids, you actually get higher numbers needed to treat. The higher the number needed to treat, the less efficacious the treatment because the higher the number you need to treat, the more that there's the fewer people who are uh, having a significant response. So what we think of is good pain relief, like codeine, for example. Okay. The number needed to treat is like 21, right? Whereas for uh, the NSAID ibuprofen and the kind of unique pain reliever acetaminophen, the number needed to treat is lower. That doesn't mean that everyone needs to be on ibuprofen and acetaminophen, but it means that if you're going to start with analgesia, start with something like standing Tylenol, or start with something like standing Tylenol plus an anti-inflammatory like ibuprofen, and that if you're going to add an opiate, the opiate isn't the first thing, right? You're not starting with oxycodone or hydrocodone, but you're saying, okay, we're gonna start with analgesia like acetaminophen and uh, like naproxen or ibuprofen, and then add an opioid on top of that, because these will lower people's opioid pain requirements. In many cases, post-operative dental pain includes an inflammatory component. That's the rationale for using NSAIDs, right? Because that r reduces um, uh, oral, well, and all uh, inflammation in the body. Mild to moderate pain can generally be managed by non-opioids, ibuprofen, acetaminophen, or the combination of the two. Um, and this comes from uh, evidence for analgesic effects in acute pain from the journal Pain. Combining ibuprofen and acetaminophen for acute pain after third moral extractions. Um, this is uh, the sum of the pain intensity difference and the pain relief score. So the higher the score, the better the pain relief. And what's interesting is uh, the uh, ibuprofen with acetaminophen seemed to outperform ibuprofen, um, seemed to outperform ibuprofen with codeine or um, uh, Tylenol with codeine, interestingly. 
And then acute pain management in children, systemic opioids, um, non-steroidals, and regional analgesics alone are, are combined uh, with additives are currently used to provide effective postoperative analgesia. So it's not that you can't use opiates, but typically if you're going to give a, a pediatric patient an agent for pain, you want to try to combine different strategies rather than relying all on one. These modalities are best utilized when combined as a multipodal approach in the perioperative setting. So here is rational polypharmacy. We generally think the fewer agents the better, but for pain control, particularly if you're thinking about something that has a higher risk profile like opioids, um, combining, say, uh, uh, pain relief was highest for oxycodone and ibuprofen than it was for ibuprofen alone, although ibuprofen did get significant pain relief. And the oxycodone on its, uh, on its own was not better than placebo in uh, this particular anesthesia progress study published in 2010. Um, and this is, again, another rational polypharmacy, ibuprofen for the oxycodone. Um, the the uh, total pain relief score was better for this combination treatment than, say, acetaminophen plus oxycodone um, or acetaminophen plus hydrocodone um, or these other regimens. Okay. And then for pain management in infants, children, adolescents, and individuals with special, special health care needs, I'll point out that there's a whole, like, paper on this. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole paper to you, but I will say that um, the, the paper does recommend using, one, doing a detailed pain assessment, and two, then tailoring the regimen that one might prescribe in response to pain to the patient. So acetaminophen is like, there, there's anesthesiologists that swear by standing acetaminophen. And one of the challenges with PRN acetaminophen is that you're oftentimes catch, kind of waiting to catch up, right? You might prescribe PRN Tylenol, but then somebody doesn't like take enough, and so then they're in pain, and so you're always sort of catching up. But starting with like, and uh, uh, you know, with an appropriate dose of acetaminophen up front on a standing basis can help get ahead of somebody's uh, inflammatory response, and then adding that to an NSAID, uh, who are recommended as first line uh, pharmacotherapy typically for osteoarthritis and low back pain in multiple guidelines, but it's also because uh, oral pain oftentimes has an inflammatory component, is a recommended first line agent for oral pain. Um, cyclooxygenase 2 inhibitors, gabapentin and uh, uh, pregabalin can be helpful with sort of like chronic nonspecific pain, and um, antidepressants are used in adults typically for, uh, that, that can have analgesic effects in people that have a lot of pain driven by depression and anxiety. Um, other interventional treatments for pain are regional blocks or infiltration analgesia. So, like, don't be afraid to, to, to um, use injections in order to help support pain relief. And non-prescription uh, treatment for pain, I don't think, can be overstated. So, um, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of watching a kid like fall down and they hurt themselves, and then they're like apoplectic, right? They're like, oh my god, you know, there's like tears, and then like with a little bit of reassurance, within like three minutes, they're back, back completely normal. Right, um, And a lot of that has to do with the way that uh, during brain development, our cortex and our midbrains don't develop at the same rate. So the cortex, which is thought to mediate a lot of the core drives, isn't fully developed. So we as kids oftentimes range between very happy and very frustrated. And the, the emotional drive centers of our brain, which are very active, are unmediated by us, say, setting expectations and being able to regulate our affect. So, a friendly, safe environment helps a child feel more comfortable and less stressed. Child are children are exquisite at picking up at distress among the adults around them. So if the adults are freaked out, the kids are going to be freaked out. But if, the, but if the adults are like, it's cool, we got this, like we'll get through this, a controlled, safe, friendly environment helps child children feel more comfortable and less stressed and has analgesic properties in and of its own. Reducing a distress-producing stimulation, providing a calm environment for procedures, and emotional support is a key, a key component in, um, uh, in, in, in uh, non-prescription pain approaches. So considering a parental presence. When I say consider a parental presence, I mean both ways. Because some parents are themselves really anxiety-provoking, and they themselves have very difficult time regulating their own sort of uh, response to seeing their kid in pain. And that can actually help provoke pain, is if their parent freaks out. So considering parental involvement actually means both ways, knowing when to involve patients, uh, patients' parents, particularly when their parents are calming, but also know when to suggest not involving the, the patient's parents during a procedure, when it looks like the patient's parent may not be able to be a helpful support um, as part of a procedure.
Uh, so the reducing a distress producing simulation, providing a calm environment, and um, uh, so distraction is a strongly evidence-based approach, shifting attention away from pain. Um, games, uh, counting non-procedural talk, can you count the number of things in the room that look green is a common one that I use to just get people's attention away from pain. Um, sometimes I ask uh, people to wiggle their big toe as fast as they can or to, uh, to, to see how fast they can tap their fingers together. Something that gets the mind off the pain are common distraction techniques. Imagery guidelines can, um, imagery guides attention away from the procedure through imagination and storytelling. So you can ask a kid if they're verbal to say, tell me more about a time that uh, you know, talk about your last trip to a theme park, or tell me the last time you, you know, got to pet an animal. What was that like? Uh, and what do you imagine it would look like? Uh, you know, let's say somebody uh, is of the age where they are, um, uh, they have a lot of imaginary friends or a lot of imaginary characters in their lives. So tell me about, you know, what do you like to, to play with? Is it like Superman or, I mean, I'm old, so I don't, I'm not sure what kids are into now, right? But, um, but whatever it is, say, can you tell me more about uh, the story of your favorite superhero and what they might uh, be into. Um, particularly post-procedurally, when somebody is like potentially distressed in order to help get their mind off of the pain. And then um, hypnosis uh, is generally best for school age or older children because you have to follow instructions, but also alters the sensory experience and dissociates away from pain. Promising studies that haven't necessarily been validated are preparation and information. So going down and explaining exactly what the procedure is and what somebody can expect can help somebody set their expectations, but it doesn't have a strong evidence basis at this point. It's intuitive that that would help, but um, that, that hasn't been really validated yet at this point. Parent coaching or training, um, memory alterations or training, or coping self-statements are all uh, promising, but not yet uh, strongly evidence-based. And then there's emerging techniques for relaxation and breathing, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, acupuncture, candle stimulation, virtual reality, and music therapy. I mean, I know music helps me, but um, it depends on knowing what somebody, what music somebody likes to, likes to listen to. Okay, so with that as the context, that we know that um, pain control can involve medications. There's a whole lot of approaches that aren't medications, that can involve medications, and if you're gonna use medications, to start with non-opiates like acetaminophen or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, ideally in combination first, and if those aren't effective, then consider adding an opioid, right? If that's, if that's the recommendation, let's talk about opioids because this is, well, I'll talk partially about opioids. So opioids turn on the descending inhibitory systems in the midbrain. We have these pain signals that go through our spinal cord and those signals are moderated or turned off by um, uh, the inhibitory systems that opioids activate. They prevent the ascending transmission of pain signals and they inhibit C fibers in the spinal cord and inhibit an activation of peripheral nose receptors. So they do work peripherally and they work centrally. However, opioids also activate opioid receptors in the midbrain. The midbrain, specifically the ventral uh, tegmental dopamine circuit that takes dopamine from the ventral tegmentum to the nucleus accumbens gets activated by opiates. That's the addiction pathway. That's the same pathway that's activated by cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, cannabis, any, anything that's addictive can activate that pathway. Opioids activate that pathway. It results in you, uh, reward and euphoria. The other things opioids do is they turn on opiate receptors in the brainstem that are responsible for, for breathing. So if you take too many opioids, you stop breathing. And so one of the challenges with opioids is that people become generally more tolerant to the euphoric effects and the analgesic effects than they become tolerant to the respiratory suppression effects or some of the more peripheral effects like constipation effects. So you'll see people with, um, say, that might be using opioids that in a way that's other than prescribed, self-escalating their dose. And those are people at high risk of overdose because as they're escalating their dose upward, they're not always attending to their breathing rate. And if they take too much, uh, th those are people that, uh, that stop breathing and might end up overdosing. So this slide kind of demonstrates that. Right? So this is the distribution of opioid receptors throughout the body. Um, they are G protein coupled receptors, which means that um, it does take some time to kick in. They're not like ion channels where the minute that you uh, introduce the substance, um, it usually takes anywhere between 10 to 30 minutes to achieve a peak effect depending on the opioid you've taken. There's 100 polymorphisms in the morphine gene, which means that not all opioids work the same way in each person. The best way I can say to illustrate this is, um, and this is totally anecdotally, non-published, just kind of my own opinion, is the majority of people do not find opiates to be necessarily euphorogenic. 
I would peg it somewhere around two thirds. That's a, a non-scientific guess from, from my vantage point. If they take an opiate, they might find it to be sort of blunting. They might find it to that they, 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 they thinking is a little fuzzy. Maybe they're a little nauseous, maybe they're a little constipated. And yes, they probably notice the pain a little less, but they're not saying that they find it to be that dramatic, you know, that, that it has that dramatic an effect. And then there's about a third of people, they take opioids and they feel great. It is energizing. They feel euphoric. Any, any, any effects that they have, like depression, gets relieved. Um, the people that get their energy from opioids, that find a, a strong euphoric effect, are typically the people at higher risk of developing an opiate use disorder compared to people that take it, they kind of feel funny, they don't necessarily like it, and then they stop taking it at the next opportunity. Question in the back? Yeah, so the, quest so the question is, am I taking into effect the placebo response? That there's people who might respond to the placebo even if it wasn't an opioid effect. Um, so uh, this is totally non a non-tested hypothesis on my end. So I've not done a placebo-controlled trial. I have no doubt that there's a th in the third of people are people that might respond to any perceived medication agent, even if it, if it was, that, that included in that third would be a placebo response. That absolutely includes that from my, again, in my non-scientific kind of back of the envelope guess as to people who might respond strongly to an opioid or something that was, that they believe or, or sort of imputing that it might be an opioid. Um, but these polymorphisms are one of the reasons that not everyone responds to opioids in the same way and therefore not all pain responds to opioids in the same way. And so this is sort of the tricky part is that um, when, if somebody, let's say, has a history of taking opiates, let's say it's somebody with a really complicated dental history and they've had multiple procedures, they might be able to tell you, actually, I didn't really respond to that opiate, but I responded to this opiate, and that may be useful information. That said, there might be people that say, oh, I can't take any other opiate other than, oh, the one that starts with a D, what's it called? Right, like, uh, hydromorphone, which we call Dilaudid, right? And so um, knowing what somebody took before can be helpful information, but it also can be a red flag, right? It can cut both ways depending on um, the, the, the sense that you get of what the person telling you is, is this genuine information? Is it not genuine information? Are they trying to angle for something? Or is this so well supported by the medical record? Um, so not all pain response to opiates the same way, and there's incomplete cross tolerance between opiates. So I'm going to say something to you later in this talk around morphine equivalents. Unfortunately, morphine equivalents are actually false because the way that things bind to your opiate receptors depends on the molecule. So nothing is ever perfectly equivalent. We have a rough guide. Morphine equivalents are a very loose way of comparing one opioid to another opioid, but um, it's, it is just that, a very loose uh, uh, comparison. Um, they are not equal because the molecules are different. They affect the opioid receptor a little bit differently. There are differences in the way the opioid receptors are expressed. And so, um, so there's an opioid I'll, I'll tell you about later called buprenorphine. It's used in uh, veterinary medicine in the United States all the time and used for analgesia in Europe and other places. In the United States, we've had a big uh, boom in the prescription of buprenorphine for opiate addiction. Kind of like you can use methadone to treat opiate addiction, you can use buprenorphine to treat opiate addiction. Um, and so people say, well, what's the equivalence? And the truth is, buprenorphine is such a unique molecule that has such a high affinity for the opiate receptor that you actually titrate buprenorphine to effect. You don't even aim for a specific dose. You titrate it because some people with a huge opiate requirement need just a touch of buprenorphine and they're fine. And there's some people with a minimal, say, uh, 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 oxycodone equivalent or uh, hydrocodone equivalent, and then there's super high dose of buprenorphine. So I, I have a fair amount of deference around the use of these molecules because not everyone responds in the same way. Um, and so morphine equivalence to me is a very loose guide, but I'm always checking in with patients uh, who are prescribed opioids in order to make sure that they're responding appropriately and dot, 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 not developing a use disorder. Pediatric considerations is codeine and tramadol are considered to be contraindicated for the treatment of pain younger than age 12. Um, a lot of that has to do with the way that codeine and tramadol are metabolized. And uh, tramadol can have toxic metabolites that increase the rate of seizures that, that children are particularly susceptible to. Um, the lower onset of action um, and uh, lower, slower onset of action and high dose formulations, particularly extended release or long acting opiates, should not be prescribed for acute pain in opioid naive patients. Opioids, that said, opioids remain the most commonly prescribed class of medications in the United States. We can thank a lot of drivers for this. Um, 
Opioids are prescribed heavily due to pain is the fifth vital sign, due to um, uh, various companies that manufacture opioids promoting opioids as a first line treatment for pain. Um, uh, in 2014, there were 245 million prescriptions for opioids. Um, of these prescriptions, 35% were for long term, that is three weeks of therapy or more. And 3 to 4% of the adult population, which is somewhere between 10 and 11 half million people, are prescribed longer term opioid therapy. And this is for adults. This, is, this tends not to be for kids. I know one of the things, uh, so, and I say this with, uh, what's the word? With uh, deference and respect. One of the things that was shocking to me, um, so my uh, uh, husband went in for a, uh, what do you call it? Um, wisdom tooth extraction, right? And he got a month of opioid prescriptions like after that. And I was like, wow, that seems like an awful lot of opioids. Um, and he actually mentioned, he was like, well, yeah, my husband's an addiction psychiatrist. And the dentist was like, well, he probably won't like this prescription, <laughs> you know? Um, and so, so, so I, I can, so in other words, I get it. Like I, I sort of understand, and I'm not trying to promote or, or vilify or promote that practice, but I'm, I'm mentioning that practice as it is easy to prescribe opiates. Like it's physically, like it, well, it's becoming increasingly more difficult now, but historically sort of easy to write an opiate prescription. And when you write a long-term opiate prescription, you're less likely to get calls of pain. That I understand. Um, the point I bring up is that and a couple of slides that I'll present is that a lot of opioids floating around in the world, particularly unused opiates, has a big public health consequence, right? Because it can end up in the hands of people who aren't prescribed that medication, and that is one of the things that's driving the prescription opiate epidemic. It's, it's not necessarily the person that you're writing the prescription to, it's the family member of that person that might have an opiate use disorder that might find themselves tempted that, by that prescription. So to that point, I'm uh, treating a patient now who used to work as a pharmacist and was taking opioids from the pharmacy that he, where he was working. And you know, he did that for several decades, he was a very smart guy. But he, um, uh, eventually pharmacy technology is getting better and better, and he had you know, fewer and fewer opportunities to begin to sort of uh, uh, feed his opioid habit. And so, uh, well, he ended up being invited by the California Board of Pharmacy to no longer practice as a pharmacist. And he uh, uh, so came to me and uh, ended up sort of prescribing him buprenorphine for opioid use disorder. And he uh, wanted to come off of this maintenance medication, so, so I ended up tapering him off of buprenorphine. Um, and he actually did fine. Now, not everyone does fine, but he did fine until his wife came home after a dental procedure with a bottle of Vicodin. Mm -hmm. With a bottle of Vicodin. And it was, every, it was like, if you've ever seen um, Lord of the Rings, it was like the Eye of Sauron in that, in that medicine cabinet, you know, like always <laughs> watching him. And uh, so he ended up, so what you're supposed to do with unused opioids is mix them with coffee grounds or put them in kitty litter. That's, that's what you're supposed to do. He flushed them down the toilet. It's not recommended to, to flush prescription medication down the toilet. You're supposed to dispose of them in the trash, mixed or ground up with coffee litter or uh, coffee grounds. But he flushed them down the toilet. And um, with, you know, with, uh, with the support of his wife and under, you know, under guidance, and we, and we sort of talked about it, which tells me that um, having opiates around, even if it's not for the patient, can be triggering depending on the context, the set and the setting. So opiates themselves are not necessarily bad or good medications, but they're medications that can be, that are useful in a very specific context and can be very harmful when used or diverted outside of that context. Okay, um, trends in pediatric deaths from prescriptions and illicit opioids. So, um, this is sort of a, a, a graph that I think was weird, the way that JAMA published it. But this is what's called the smooth mortality rate between the, ages of, uh, between the years of 1999 and 2016. And uh, this was looking at a database of uh, pediatric deaths from prescriptions and illicit opioids, um, finding that the mortality rate per 100,000 ranged between, say, 0.2-ish uh, deaths per 100,000 up to like 0.8, so four times the prevalence between 1999 and 2008, uh, 2009. We saw a brief, a brief dip and then an increase back to that level in uh, 2016. And um, uh, these were largely non-Hispanic whites. Uh, I'm trying to think of where the study was conducted. I think it was out of Ohio or Kentucky, but um, and, and so now this is the graph sort of turned on its side, but uh, if you want to look at what is the age range and what is the opioid, um, we're seeing that it's, uh, a lot of this is driven by the prescription opioids, right, from 1999 
up until 2016. And then we saw a drop in prescription opioids as people were converting from prescription opioids to heroin. So one of the, one of the big risks if you flood uh, a population with prescription opioids is if you just stop the prescription opioids and you don't refer people to treatment, they'll just switch from the prescribed opiate to the black market in order to go get more opioids. And so that's one of the, I'm gonna go back a slide, one of the drivers of the uptick is actually not prescription opioids. We've seen a drop in prescription opiates, but an uptick in um, heroin and an uptick in synthetic opioids other than methadone. And for the sake of our discussion here today, prescription opioids other than methadone is fentanyl. Is fentanyl because it's uh, commercially available on the street. I say commercially, I mean, you can't buy, I mean, you, you, one can prescribe fentanyl, but that's not the fentanyl we're talking about. It's usually street fentanyl made in China that's sold, um, and we're seeing a big spike in fentanyl in the United States. So that's one of the things that's driving this latest uptick is not a rise in prescription opioids, but is a conversion from people who are coming off of prescriptions and then onto, um, onto heroin. And now you might say, yeah, but these are kids. You know, like what are you, what are you talking about? Like th this happens with adults, but these are kids. Well, um, the things that kids are exposed to are the things that adults have in their home. So many opioid exposures aren't necessarily the kid um, going out and buying opioids on the street. They're using their mom's bag of heroin or bag of fentanyl or other substances that have been brought into the household. This was annual opioid prescription prevalence for ambulatory children without major chronic disease in Tennessee care between 1999 and 2014. And uh, this was uh, ranges between the year 2000 and 2014. We saw the adolescent group um, uh, had a, uh, a proportion of children like 20 percent of, uh, of children were prescribed opioids at least once. So that if a fifth of kids in Tennessee between the ages of 12 and 17 got exposed to an opioid, that's a relatively, from my perspective, high rate of exposure for kids that don't have a major chronic disease. Now, it doesn't mean it was an inappropriate prescription. It just means that there's a lot of prescriptions out there um, for kids. And if you look at the cumulative incidence of opioid-related events in, the, in that study, we saw, particularly for adolescents, that in the days since prescription was filled, we saw an increase in the rate of um, incidence of opioid-related adverse events. So what's an opioid-related adverse event? Could be um, a fatal or non-fatal overdose. It could be people that um, uh, ended up coming to cellular law enforcement attention related to um, their, say, selling or diverting a prescription. A lot of that's driven by adolescents, don't get me wrong, but uh, the more opioids in our system, or, or in a health system or in a population of people, the more things that, that are opioid related can go wrong. And this slide really demonstrates that. This is from the Center for Disease Control. Between 1999 and 2009, we saw a very clean concordance between uh, the sales of opioid prescriptions. So these are opioid prescription medication sales, kilogram per 10,000 of the population, that maps very nicely onto the death rate um, opioid prescription deaths per 100,000 people. So these scales are different, but the, the curve is the same curve. And then the, the uh, opioid treatment admissions. So this is a slide to really say, uh, in the United States, we're in the middle of an opioid epidemic. And this was a study, again, out of JAMA, looking at the characteristics of opioid prescriptions since 2009. Between the ages of uh, 09, 10, and 19, and 20 and 29, Dentists have historically been um, uh, a significant prescriber of opioids. Because the thing is, a lot, lot of kids between 2019 and 19 aren't going to general practitioners for healthcare, right? They might go for well child care, uh, visits, but they're not usually going for procedures or other types of care where opioids are gonna typically be prescribed. So that's why actually opioids are more commonly prescribed in this age group, is it's not inappropriate but what it means is that I think that there's an imperative for dentists to be using the same standard precautions and um, attentive to the risks of opioid prescribing as everybody else um, because uh, dentists are a category of major prescribers in uh, pediatric age groups. Okay, so the Substance Use Mental Health Service Administration does something called the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. It is a household survey, so it uh, does not capture people who are a domicile or don't have a, a home or a phone. Um, that looks at uh, substance use. So they ask people about what substances do you use? And in the United States, it's estimated based on the 2017 NISDA that two, 26 million people in the United States smoke marijuana. Marijuana uh, is in the state of California, um, essentially de facto legalized, right? Uh, it, it is now available for commercial sale. 
The federal government counts marijuana as a Schedule I illicit drug. So that's why it's counted in this graph as an illicit drug, even though it itself, its legal status is somewhat different. But then next up after marijuana, it's 3.2 million people with prescription pain reliever abuse. And then I'll also point out like stimulant and prescription tranquilizer misuse is like not that far behind. And then you see things like cocaine, hallucinogens, methamphetamine, inhalants. Heroin remains relatively rare, right? Uh, 500,000 people in the United States are, are uh, thought to have a heroin use disorder. If you look at the past month prescription prevalence misuse and then stratified by age, you see that pain relievers um, the percent of people in the United States that are thought to be using uh, or uh, misusing pain relievers among ages 12 and older is 1.2%, uh, and it's thought to be highest among the 18 to 25 year olds. All right, so this is the overall rate, and this is the highest prevalence. And, but it's also, that risk is also highest for tranquilizer stimulants and, and sedatives as well. And the source of prescription pain relievers for non-medical use is I got it from a friend or relative for free. It was in the medicine cabinet and I found it, right? Or I bought one from a doctor, I was doctor shopping or bought it from a friend or took it without asking or bought it from a drug dealer. But from a friend or relative is by far and away the most common source of prescription pain relievers for non-medical use. This is a different survey than the survey I just showed you. This is something called the Monitoring the Future Survey, which is a survey of high schoolers. So it surveys uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. And we see among 10th, 11th, and 12th graders between the years 2012 and 2016, actually a pretty significant drop specifically in Vicodin among um, uh, uh, ages, uh, well, in, uh, among 12th graders between the ages of 2012 and 2016. But the percentages are not like fractions of percentages. We're going from like 7% to 3%. And um, among prescriptions, we are seeing amphetamines, tranquilizers, and opiates in this particular study um, to be higher rate than uh, opiates other than he heroin, but that uh, separates out opioids other than heroin from cough medicines. Opiate use disorder, that is people that don't just maybe play with opioids, but have developed, say, tolerance, withdrawal, and are continuing to use despite the harm, and they're using in a way that's compulsive. We find that uh, uh, there's, uh, what, 210, uh, and this is in thousands, so this is two, um, uh, yeah, if I got this right, to two million people, right, between the ages of 12 and other that met criteria for opioid use disorder altogether. Um, that is 0.8% of the population. We see um, uh, between the ages of 12 and 17, those numbers are relatively low. Between 18 and 25, 1.3% of uh, people between 18 and 25 meet criteria for opioid use disorder. Um, that doesn't mean you can't prescribe opioids, right? But what that means is that if you're going to prescribe an opiate, that you do it in a context that maximizes its safety. Allergies to opioids are rare. I can't remember I've ever that anyone that's had a validated, say, anaphylactic reaction to opioids. They almost never cause like that type of allergy. Side effects are common though. So people are oftentimes nauseous, sedated, constipated. It can cause urinary retention. It can cause sweating. So side effects are common, even though the allergies are rare. And organ toxicities tend to be rare. Opioids do affect, affect the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. They increase prolactin, they decrease luteinizing hormone, uh, follicular stimulating hormone, testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. Um, uh, and uh, they're thought to, over time, sometimes decrease bone density. Um, but that said, you rarely see people develop cardiac problems, liver problems, gastrointestinal problems the way that you would say with alcohol or other types of intoxicants. Overdose is common if they are prescribed with sedatives. So one of the big risk factors for somebody that's not going to do well on an opioid is are they prescribed a sedative? And by sedative, I specifically mean benzodiazepines and barbiturates. You can give opioids with things that are sedating like, say, anticholinergic medications, antihistamines. Um, they're not, it's not a total contraindication because antihistamines tend not to affect the breathing center as much as, uh, say, benzodiazepines or barbiturates do. And what is the addiction risk? So I remember I was a uh, medical student here in Los Angeles, and I was in the emergency room, and the emergency room wrote a prescription for opioids and said, the addiction risk from opioids is less than 1% from a famous letter to the New England Journal that looked at opioids that were prescribed typically in a hospital or medical center um, briefly, and then looked at how many of those people developed an opiate use disorder. Opiate use disorder is very rare in people who are prescribed opioids briefly for one time. 
Where the opioid use disorder risk goes up is when people are prescribed opioids chronically. Now, as dentists, most dentists don't prescribe opioids chronically, right? Because at some point, whatever dental procedure or whatever um, dental pathology is driving the pain is either addressed or you find another way of, of, of uh, well, addressing the pain. So chronic opiates, the risk is not 1%. For chronic opioids, the risk is between 3 and 19%, depending on the population. The studies range, but the risk is not less than 1 in 100. The risk is somewhere between 3 in 100 and like a fifth um, of chronic pain populations. And the known risk factors are anybody who uses illicit substances that includes cannabis, prescription drugs, alcohol, or nicotine. People forget about nicotine, but nicotine use actually has a strong concordance with opioid use disorder. A lifetime history of any substance use disorder, even if somebody's in recovery, does put them at higher risk. That means by in recovery, I mean they're not using anymore, right? They had a substance disorder, they went to treatment, they're not using anymore. Um, but the risk of then introducing opiates to that person, the risk goes up. A family history of a substance use disorder, a uh, history of legal problems and drug and alcohol abuse is associated with increased risk, and a history of severe depression and anxiety are all associated with increased risk that a patient might not do well on opioids. The risk of fatal overdose seems to be directly related to the maximum prescription, uh, the, the strength. So I'm going to use the word morphine equivalence here, not because I think morphine equivalents are the best way to compare opioids, but just as a back of the envelope way of trying to quantify what is uh, considered to be an unsafe, uh, say, maximum dose for opioids, recognizing that everyone responds to opioids differently. It looks like morphine equivalents between, uh, say, 50 to 100 milligrams a day have a fourfold increase of overdose risk, and doses over 100 milligrams a day have a ninefold increase in overdose risk with a 1.8% annual overdose rate. Um, so how do you overdose? Well, the, rest of the medulla respiratory center in the brain stops uh, your, uh, your breathing drive. So you fall asleep, you're not consciously breathing, your medulla says, we're good, we don't need to breathe, and that's how you die. It decreases tidal volume and minute ventilation. It's immediately life-threatening. Sedation occurs before significant respiratory suppression. So if somebody's nodding off and falling asleep after taking an opioid, that then, then they're on the potential, doesn't mean that they're gonna overdose, but that means that they're on that potentially on that trajectory. And because of the possibility of respiratory suppression, patients and parents should be counseled not to increase dosage to get better pain control, particularly at night when respiratory rate normally decreases anyway. This is a graph illustrating just that. Um, the opioid dosage in morphine equivalents, uh, this is per day, between one and 19, um, the percent of uh, uh, person years, uh, sort of, you know, this is uh, the number of people sort of exposed, but as the um, overdose risk goes way up as the dosage of the pain medication or the opioid goes up. Other factors associated with overdose and addiction risks. So high dose opioids associated with overdose and addiction. Long acting or extended release formulations such as the fentanyl patch, methadone, oxycodone extended release, um, or morphine extended release is associated with overdose. Combining with benzodiazepines associated with overdose. Long-term opi use over three months, overdose and addiction risk. And then um, uh, shortly initiating a long-acting or extended release formulation within two weeks is also associated with overdose as people are coming to steady state and their bodies are getting used to metabolizing the drug off. Um, older patients can overdose. Disordered sleep breathing, overdose. Renal hepatic impairment associated with overdose. Depression and substance use disorder is associated with overdose and addiction. History of overdose associated with overdose and adolescence is associated with addiction. So what I recommend, and it's not, so what I would recommend is something called standard precautions for opioid prescribing. I do think a, a, a clinician with a DEA certificate can learn to prescribe opioids well, but you have to follow a process. So this is the process. Prior to prescribing, perform the following for all patients. Check cures to corroborate their controlled substance history, particularly their recent controlled substance history. Talk to all other providers, particularly if those providers are prescribing things that the patient didn't report or that you otherwise didn't know about. To assess prescription opioid misuse risk, including tobacco, alcohol, illicit drug, and prescription use, uh, misuse history. And there's something called the SOAP SF, um, or Standard Opioid Addi um, Addiction Risk uh, Profile Short Form which I'll 
uh, show you guys that you can use. You can even have patients self fill it out themselves. You don't necessarily have to administer it to them. Redu review the opioid risk benefits and alternatives and document that somebody understands that opioids can be life-threatening and can be habit-forming. To prescribe the minimum amount of opioid based on the expected duration of severe pain, uh, that you're layering opioids on top of a pain regimen that doesn't involve opioids, and I always think it's good to check in with patients. So anytime that I have a patient that I'm making active, you know, saying managing active pain, I usually like to see them back in days to a week, right, rather than saying I'll see you back in, in a month to see how things have healed up. Giving prescription opioid diuretics, no more than four tablets a day, being very specific about uh, how much somebody can or can't take, and if pain is more severe, lasts longer than expected, to reassess before just throwing on additional opioids, and explain how to store opioids safely. So one of the reasons that families get into trouble with opioids is that the opioids have been kept somewhere open, like an uh, unlocked cabinet. There are now, um, it's funny, I was just at the pharmacy before I came here today, and the pharmacies are now selling lockboxes, or places where you can secure your medicine that aren't just open and available to people. And uh, to tell people how to properly dispose of any used opioids, coffee grounds, kitty litter. Um, you can also do, they're called drug take-back programs, but they're not universally available. And they, um, I think they're great if you can find them, but they're not always, uh, it's not always easy to find one that's convenient at any given time. But I support drug take-back programs. If you can't find one, coffee grounds, kitty litter. Okay. Um, I recommend that every dental office has a controlled substances policy. And that policy that says uh, that protects all patients and the public and community health and consistently applies opioid prescribing precautions. So that way, um, uh, individual patients don't ever feel like they're being singled out. Everyone gets kind of the standard treatment, right? The standard treatment is we are going through all of this with every patient that we're prescribing to an, an opioid to and their families, particularly if they're pediatric patients. It standardizes systems of care and is resonant with expert guidelines. So here is medicine safely for children and teens. Do not share prescribed medicines. Do not save the prescribed medicines unless you've been directed to. Secure all medicines. Make sure children and teens take their medicines correctly. Follow all instructions from the doctor or pharmacist. Talk to your child's doctor, and that includes dentist, um, if you have any uh, patients, and get rid of all old or unused medicines. Follow the instructions on the medicine label. If the label doesn't give instructions, look for a take-back program. If they're not available, um, coffee grounds, dirt, or kitty litter, and throw in the trash. Right? Health, uh, healthychildren.org, medicine safety. This, can be, this is like, I think, just kind of like a standard um, office-controlled substance policy. But part of your office policy isn't just what to tell the patients. It's also um, your policy on things like early refills. Um, do you do urine toxicology in the office for patients that are at risk? Um, those are uh, all things that were, would be considered, and I'll go through, could be part of a, a practices approach to treating patients um, with opioids. So open use disorder and dental practice, the latest on how to identify, treat, refer, and apply laws and regulations in your practice. Um, I had included um, this article as, uh, I think, optional reading. Um, I would recommend that, uh, and this was published you know, not too long ago, it's less than two years ago, that anybody that uh, is really interested in upgrading their, say, pain management game, to consider this, um, because this is a really useful framework for applying laws and regulations to practice. So this is a lot of the material that I was asked to cover is, so what's going on with all these new laws? So this is the California Dental Association, new opiate laws that affect dentistry in 2019 and, and beyond. Beginning January 1st of this year, prescribers have to discuss the following with the minor and the minor's parent or guardian before issuing the first opioid prescription. The risks of addiction and overdose are associated with the use of opioids. The, incre the increased risk of addiction to an opiate to an individual suffering from both mental um, and substance abuse disorders is increased, and the danger of taking an opiate with a benzodiazepine, alcohol, or other CNS depressant. This is required for any prescriber prescribing an opioid to a minor. Uh, AB 2789. Um, in beginning January 1st, 22nd, um, all healthcare providers um, authorized to issue controlled and uncontrolled prescriptions have to have the capacity to transmit prescriptions electronically. And I have a private practice in psychiatry, and I will have to install an electronic medical record, much to my chagrin. But for those of you that have office-based practices and don't have an EMR with an electronic um, prescribing token, we'll have to have one by January 1st, 2020. Um, the Assembly Bill 2086, 
enables prescribers to look up any prescriptions to what they're attached. So you can look up in Cures, which is the California Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, to see all prescriptions to which you've been attached for controlled substances. And then there's the Interstate Cures Access Agreement and the Controlled Substance Prescription Pen Requirements. I don't know how many of you have noticed that yet or have ever tried to um, I, I have a pad that doesn't have the 15 digit serial number on it and I've had to order new pads um, uh, simply because of this. And then there's also another law. Um, uh, so, uh, well, I'll get into SB. There's another law, oh gosh, uh, I don't remember the bill number, but it also affects, uh, well, dentists and all prescribers, um, is anybody that is getting a high dose opioid, right? So anybody who has an opioid for nine, or is being prescribed 90 morphine equivalents or higher of an opioid or is being prescribed any dose of an opioid with um, a, uh, a sedative like a benzodiazepine, or anybody who's getting an opioid and has a history of any substance use disorder, including tobacco use disorder, it is now California law that that uh, patient is educated about um, how to use naloxone, which is an opioid overdose medication, and is furnished naloxone. Um, now, I will say that that's a pretty onerous law because that would mean that Let's say, hypothetically, I'm a pain doc and I have somebody on a high-dose opiate regimen and somebody has, um, say, uh, uh, dental caries or they need to be seen by a dentist, right? So I send them to the dentist. The dentist, according to law, also is responsible for prescribing the Loxone, even if they're not prescribing the pain medication. So I think that that's, that's odd. And um, Congressman Wood's office in, uh, in, uh, in the assembly is looking at potentially revising that. But the way the law is written right now is sort of vague as to whether or somebody who might have 30 visits with any clinicians over the course of a month has to get 30 prescriptions <laughs> for Narcan plus 30 documented you know, education visits. What I, what I have recommended in, within the County Department of Health Services and what I'm recommending it for health systems to do is um, it makes sense for somebody with an opioid use disorder and it makes sense that anyone's being prescribed an opioid or an opioid and another sedating medication, that it's the prescriber of that opioid who's responsible for co kind of co-dispensing the naloxone and who's responsible for doing the education. Um, but if that person neglects to do that, I think it's good form for other prescribers, specifically including dentists, to not miss an opportunity to intervene, but I don't think it's necessarily the non, the person who's not prescribing the opiates their responsibility to be legally forced to do that. So Senate Bill 1109, the informed consent form. So the law says that consent should review patient and family responsibility and the patient uh, agrees not to give, sell opiate medications to anybody. So it talks about disposal of unused medication, kind of the stuff just to go back, a lot of the stuff that's covered here, um, but it also requires somebody to sign a form that they understand the side effects may include or not limited to rash, constipation, sexual dysfunction, sleeping abnormalities, sweating, edema, sedation, confusion, depression, increased sensitivity to pain or impaired motor ability. Um, there is a standardized form through, there is a um, insurer uh, that uh, markets itself to dentists in California, has a relationship with the California Dental Association. This is what the form looks like, and I think I sent the link out. Um, but if anyone needs, this is kind of the now standard um, uh, consent form that it's recommended uh, associated with 11, uh, 1109 through kind of, the, from what I read, the leading dental malpractice carrier in the state of California. And again, this is informed consent for minors, specific to people under the age of 18. Okay, so um, how many of you he of here have heard of Cures? How many of you have yet to hear of Cures? Welcome, all right, cool. So Cures is the California Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. It is a database that you can look up any controlled substance that was prescribed think, and don't hold me to this, with the exception of Schedule 5, right? I, th I don't think Schedule 5 is there, but Schedules 2 through 4 are there. And so I have to look up whether Schedule 5 is included. Um, and there's a law, as of October 2nd, 2018, um, every prescriber that has a DEA waiver has to register on cures and has to check cures if they are prescribing, ordering, administering, or furnishing a controlled substance unless they're in an emergency room or unless it's out of a hospital unit, but any outpatient, you have to check before you prescribe a patient a controlled substance. And within 24 hours or the previous business day before prescribing, ordering, administering, or furnishing a controlled substance, um, before subsequently prescribing a controlled substance, if let's say someone comes back to the emergency room again and again, you only get that exception the first emergency room visit. And at least once every four months if somebody's on a controlled substance. So 
I have a few patients that I prescribe, say, stimulants for ADHD. And I have to check cures at least once every four months. Practically, what I do is I just check it before every prescription. Right? I just check to make sure that the cures database says what it's supposed to say, or I should say doesn't say things that it shouldn't say. This is what it looks like to register. So if you go, if you Google like California Cures or Cures PDMP, you'll get to the um, Office of the Attorney General, which is who hosts it. Uh, you click on Cures Registration. You then put in uh, your user role. We're all prescribers. So anyone that's a prescriber gets listed as a prescriber. And then um, your uh, license would ostensibly be through the California Department of Consumer Affairs if you have a dental license or a medical license. Um, you put in an email address. And then you click that you're not a robot. And then once you've registered, then you go to the Cures login and you're issued a, a, a user ID and password. Once you log in, this is what it looks like. So that's my name, this is, I'm a prescriber. And you click on patient activity uh, report. If another prescriber wanted to contact me, says, Dr. Hurley, I noticed that you prescribed X, Y, or Z to my patient, that message would show up here, right? So right on my homepage, I would see any messages or any alerts on any of my patients. But if I click on patient activity report, then I get this screen, which has a first name, last name, and date of birth. And those are the only data fields that I have to fill in to run a report. So address is fine, nice zip code is fine if you have it, but you don't have to put those in to run the report. The only mandated fields to run a cures report are last name, first name, and date of birth. And then the time period, I always move this to 12, just because, I don't know, I'm nosy. But, um, but you can set it at any, at any particular time. And then you click search, and then it generates a report. Now, I can't show you a generated report without violating HIPAA, but the reports have um, the patient's name, the patient's date of birth, the patient's address, and then it has which pharmacy did they go to, what did they pick up, how many did they pick up or whatever they picked up. So it will tell me like, say, uh, Adderall 20 or Oxycodone 5 or whatever, and then it will say exactly how many they picked up, how many days it was for, so I can kind of impute based on the dispensed, um, the, the number that was dispensed, how many they were supposed to take per day. And then uh, it tells me which pharmacy they got it from and the phone number to that pharmacy. So it's a decent, like you get a decent amount of information. I will say it has been some ways if I like can't remember what my patient's address, like if I can't get to my charts and I need to know what's my patient's address, like from my phone, I can log into Cures and then like shook and, and, and you can like, you can use that to get a lot of useful information with somebody's first name, last name, and date of birth. But um, you have to comply with the Cures 2.0 terms and conditions, which means um, that you're using it with a patient that's yours, and you're using it in, in the context of uh, a therapeutic treatment. That you're not, um, say, looking up your friends or people that you're not a provider to, and that uh, uh, like research studies are not permitted to use Cures without like an IRB and like a process. But you can't just like go through all of pa your patients on a, on a sample or say. Um, participants in a study without uh, their explicit consent and without going through an IRB. So risks of access for opioid use disorder. We sort of mentioned some of these, but personal history of a substance use disorder, adults under the age of 45, a family through a substance use disorder, legal history such as a DUI or incarceration, and mental health problems are all associated with increased problems with opioid use. There's a couple um, screening tools that you can use in, uh, say, dental or sort of general pediatric practice in order to help figure out um, whether somebody uh, has used opioids or other substances. And these are validated ways of asking these questions. So one way that's not valid to ask these questions is like, you don't use drugs, right? Like that's not <laughs> like, a, like a standard way of finding out whether somebody used drugs. But it would say, over the past year, how many times have you used tobacco, alcohol, or marijuana? And there's actually, if you go to um, uh, drugabuse.gov slash AST, that's screening to brief intervention, um, or you can cl click on this link and download the PDF. Uh, this is actually something that you can fill in on the internet. Um, it also asks about prescription drugs, inhalants, uh, herbs or synthetic drugs, or other illegal drugs. And this is validated for adolescents. And then um, the screening to brief intervention sort of says, if, if you say, I've never used alcohol, you've never used tobacco, you've never used marijuana, or click never, then you, uh, you're stopping the screening. But if somebody says yes to any of those, those are then also associated with increased risk of misuse of prescription drugs, illegal drugs, inhalants, or herbs or synthetic drugs. So this is the opioid risk assessment. This is the screener and opioid assessment for patients with pain.
Um, the, this is validated for adults, not for kids. So let me just be like super explicit about that. This is not an, uh, a pediatric screener. But it says, um, uh, how often do you have mood swings? How often do you smoke a cigarette within an hour of waking up? How often do you take medications other than the way it was prescribed? How often have you used an uh, illegal drug, such so as marijuana, cocaine, or et cetera, in the past five years? And in California, sometimes we have to have the caveat, illegal drugs or marijuana, because that the legal status is sometimes, uh, well, confusing. It is confusing. And then how often in your lifetime have you had legal problems? If uh, you can answer this on a zero, to, which is never, to four scale, and anything four or more is considered to be positive. It does not mean that you pr can't prescribe opiates to people with mood swings. But what it means is that somebody with a high risk history, an adult with a high risk history, again, it's validated for adults, not children, um, uh, that you would want to increase the amount of monitoring and support that goes with that opioid prescription. So you might consider doing urine toxicology and abbreviating the prescription and doing more frequent visits. And when they come back, doing pill counts, right? Those are all things, uh, the monitoring that you would want to put into place to support an opioid prescription that in somebody who's at higher risk. And how do you know if your patient has an addiction to opioids? Well, anybody who's prescribed opioids long term, which again is not super common in like most standard dental practice, but there are patients who are on opiates long term. Patients who are on opioids long term invariably develop tolerance. It's just, it's just part of the deal, right? Tolerance is almost inevitable. And um, if you withdraw an opiate suddenly from somebody who's physically tolerant, you're gonna get withdrawal. Those are, it's like gravity, that will always happen. So tolerance and withdrawal does not mean that somebody has a use disorder. It just means that their physiology has gotten accustomed to the use of opioids. Um, aberrant medication-taking behavior, such as I can't control my opioid use, I'm using compulsively, and I'm using even when the opioids are causing me harm, that's considered to be a hallmark of addiction, the three Cs, loss of control, compulsive use, and use despite harm. And then, um, uh, people develop something called opiate dependence or opioid use disorder, which is a whole constellation of behavioral symptoms that are associated with opioid use. Um, there's this misconception that addiction is the same as physical dependence and tolerance, and it's not. You, people will develop physical dependence and tolerance if they're on an opiate long enough. Uh, addiction is characterized by somebody who is not using them appropriately, right? Somebody who is escalating their dose, somebody who is not working because of the opioids they're using, somebody who has sort of reoriented their behavior around opioids. Um, there's this idea that addiction is simply a set of bad choices. And in fact, this is well permeated into our legal system. As people with opioid use disorder oftentimes get treated as criminals. And in fact, it hasn't really been until the prescription opioid epidemic that has largely affected white people in the middle of the country, right, sort of the Appalachia, that the federal government's response to people with opioid use disorder sort of shifted away from incarceration and let's get all of these people with substance use disorders um, uh, sort of off of our streets to we need to get people treatment, right? And we've seen a big push during the Obama and now the Trump administration, that's one of the things that's funding, right, this talk is the state targeted response that comes from a sort of a changing attitudes around prescription opioid use disorder. But addiction has been around for a long time and is not willful in the sense that um, uh, people with an opioid use disorder oftentimes don't have the frontal lobe function to not use in a certain situation. So somebody with an alcohol use disorder, the, it's almost like the minute they're in a bar, they're gonna, like it's, it's that, that they, that's a, a sort of hyper learned behavior. They're gonna go to the bar and order a drink and they're gonna keep drinking kind of un until they physically like can't drink anymore. Typical alcohol use disorder behavior. That's very different. Um, that doesn't mean people with uh, a substance use disorder can't abstain. Um, I see people, with, I work right now in the uh, LA County Jail, so that's where I see patients in the Twin Towers Correctional Facility. Um, people can usually stop using drugs when they're in front of a judge. They're typically not using substances in that situation. So it doesn't mean that you don't have any control. It just, you have impaired control in certain situations. People with substance use disorders do respond to treatment. And in fact, we've got really good treatments for opioid use disorder that can really help take somebody from actively using to not using anymore. Um, that make addiction as a much more complicated, it's not simply a set of bad choices. It doesn't mean that people with opioid use disorder aren't making bad choices, but it means that the use itself is encumbered in a set of brain pathology that's hyper learned. There's this idea that if you have genuine pain, then you can't become addicted to opioids, and that's not true. 
right? There's people with opioid use disorder that are in genuine pain. Um, there's this also idea that only long-term use of certain opioids, like uh, hydromorphone's addictive, but not uh, say meparazine, or that oxycodone's addictive, but hydrocodone isn't. That's false. I have treated lots of people with tramadol addiction. I've treated lots of people with addiction to opioids that are thought to be less addictive. So there is no abuse resistant form of opioids. And there is this idea that only patients with certain characteristics. So, well, you don't have a family history, so you can't become addicted. And that's not true. People can develop an, uh, any substance use disorder, even if they don't have a family history of it, even if they don't have mood swings, even if they're not tobacco smokers. Everybody has a vulnerability, kind of like cancer, right? Like anyone could potentially get cancer. There's certain risk factors that we know are associated with higher rates of cancer. Certain risk factors we know are associated with higher rates of addiction. But um, uh, everyone is potentially vulnerable to OP use disorder. And then there's this idea that if you have somebody on a maintenance treatment such as methadone or buprenorphine, that they're just substitutes for heroin or opioid. And one of the things about heroin use um, in particular is heroin is relatively short acting. <coughs> you take it, you get high, then it metabolizes off, and you want more. Pretty, it's a relatively sort of standard curve. And um, so people with a heroin use disorder oftentimes have no idea where they're gonna be at any given point. So let's say I'm seeing, talking, and I have this poor guy, I have this poor patient, he's got a really bad oxycodone use disorder, and, um, and we try to make appointments, and it's on Monday, and we're making an appointment for Thursday, because that's when I'm next available, and like, who, he, who has any idea what it, where he's gonna be that Thursday, right? Like, is he gonna be high, is he gonna be in withdrawal, and if he's in withdrawal, he's probably gonna be looking for more opioids. He's probably not gonna be trying to come in for treatment. I mean, he's somebody that needs a higher level of care than the outpatient psychiatrist. But that said, um, if, I can, if I could get this patient started, on a, a long-acting opiate like buprenorphine, which um, does not get you nearly as high as oxycodone, that is not associated with anywhere near the respiratory suppression risk, and you take it and it lasts in your system for like 60 hours, so it keeps you out of withdrawal, that can be a huge game changer, right? Because it's not like you take it and you're using it to get high, you're taking it and staving off withdrawal so that you can do things like show up to your appointments and maybe start doing therapy and maybe learning some skills to, to I don't know, get your life together. So what I um, support is people getting started on medications for addiction treatment, such as methadone or buprenorphine, in order to get out of that cycle of intoxication and withdrawal and then build some recovery. And there's some people that need to be on those treatments their whole life, just like some people with diabetes need to be on insulin their whole life. It's just kind of how it is. Um, and that that's okay. All right, um, so prescribing strategies. Universal precautions. Universal precautions are typically um, uh, that you give, well, I'll sort of get into it. Um, it you minimize the op opioids, and if you're gonna use them, use the lowest necessary dose, and initiate addiction treatment if you have a patient or a family member, and they're co-prescribed naloxone in anybody that's overdosed or that's on a uh, high-risk opioid population. Um, tolerance is defined by higher doses to obtain, analgesia, euphoria, or other desired effects. Doses up to 800 morphine equivalents have been uh, observed. I mean, like stuff that would tranquilize herds of elephants I've seen human beings take. I went to the United Kingdom to study their opiate use disorder treatment. And in the United Kingdom, it is legal to prescribe diacetylmorphine. We don't know diacetylmorphine by that name. We call diacetylmorphine heroin in the United States. But you can prescribe heroin in the United Kingdom for pain or cough or any indication that you, that you as a clinician determine is appropriate. And they have a clinic for patients with um, heroin use disorder, and they uh, will prescribe them pharmaceutical grade diacetylmorphine. Um, but the patients can't take it home. They have to give themselves an intramuscular injection. They're muscling heroin in the clinic that's uh, provided by the pharmacy. And everybody is on the max dose, which is 200 milligrams twice a day. And that's on top of like a methadone dose, so it's like 100 milligrams a day. So these people, and, and diacetylmorphine is about twice as potent as regular morphine. So all these people are on between 800 to 1,000 morphine equivalents a day worth of opioids. And they're walking, and they're talking, and they're breathing. So opioid tolerance can be extraordinary. The rate of tolerance does depend on the opiate, and the tolerance of respiratory suppression develops slower than the tolerance to analgesia and euphoria. Withdrawal is just when opiates stop, you go through opioid withdrawal, um, and it ranges between not noticeable to quite uncomfortable between one and 14 days, depending on the uh, type, dose, and duration of the opioid. Short acne opiates like heroin, oxycodone, or hydrocodone, you're out of withdrawal between three and five days. Withdrawal from methadone can take weeks, can take multiple weeks. <coughs> 
So this is the difference between physical dependence and opiate use disorder. Physical repeated administration of an opiate invariably results in the development of tolerance and physical dependence. It results from counteradaptations among your opiate receptors to maintain homeostasis, and it can take days or weeks to develop. Opiate use disorder results in 3 to 90% of individuals who prescribe chronic opioids. It's a chronic medical illness that does not resolve when the opioids are taken away. So I can prescribe you medication to treat opiate withdrawal and get somebody opioid free where they're not using opiates anymore, um, but I haven't done anything to address the brain that has learned to use opioids every day consistently over time. So those are the people that are ironically at the biggest risk of death is the people who have stopped using opioids and then, but their brain hasn't learned to function without it. So it sort of sounds odd because I've gotten them physiologically off but their brain is still used to the situations where they used opiates, where they used opiates to relieve, say, pain, or where they used opiates to relieve stress, or where they used opiates as an antidepressant, or where they used opiates to celebrate, or where they used opiates to sort of bond with friends, right? People, you learn to use opiates in different contexts. And until you retrain your brain to respond to those contexts differently, you're at risk of returning to opioid use. And people that have lost their tolerance and then returned to using opiates again, those are the people at risk of death. So I see that a lot out of jail, right? People come out of custody and they've lost their opiate tolerance and what do they go do? They go back to the same people, places, and things where they were hanging out before. They use the same dose of opiates and then they die of an opiate overdose because they've lost their tolerance. And then the other thing that's tragic is people go to treatment, right? They go to like a 28 day treatment. They're discharged from treatment. They don't participate in any aftercare. They're not on a medication for addiction treatment. Those people are also vulnerable to returning to using opiates and overdosing. Um, the opioid use disorder is a neuromolecular process that's different than that of tolerance and typically takes months to develop. And these are the 11 criteria in the DSM for opioid use disorder. It's a failure to fulfill major role obligations, use in situations which it's physically hazardous, continued substance use despite harm or recurrent consequences, tolerance and withdrawal, um, taken o uh, substance taken in larger amounts over more time than intended, you can't cut down or unsuccessful efforts to cut down, a great deal of time is spent using, and you're giving up activities related to use. Substance use continues despite problems and craving. So these are 11. If you meet four to five of these, you have a moderate use disorder. So six or more is a severe use disorder, and three or fewer is um, uh, not. Now you might say, well, hold on. If you said two criteria meets opiate use disorder criteria, and tolerance and withdrawal are on there, doesn't everybody that has tolerance and withdrawal meet substance use disorder criteria? And the answer is no. Actually, the DSM has an asterisk next to these to say if you are taking um, a uh, opioid or benzodiazepine as prescribed, you can have tolerance and withdrawal, and those don't count towards the criteria that one uses to meet opiate use disorder. So these alone don't count, but any of these others do count if you have any aberrant substance use behavior. Um, the clinical relevance is that people with opioid use disorder are particularly vulnerable to overdosing. Um, particularly because their intense drive to take the drug persists, but the tolerance that protected them from overdosing is no longer present. I think I made that point. Um, here's the type of uh, behaviors to just watch out for, and some of them range from mild flags to things that are not unnoticeable. Requests for increased opiate dose. Now, requests for increased opiate dose is not by itself inappropriate if somebody's, let's say, dental pathology is progressing, right? And you've tried uh, procedural definitive treatments for it, and they're continuing to have um, dental pain. Uh, maybe it's appropriate to increase their over overdose dose or their opioid dose, but that makes sense to do when you can verify that their primary disease process is progressing. Somebody that requests a prescription opioid by name, like, uh, you know, I only want Dilaudid, again, a red flag. Now, maybe they have tried other opiates and they just have a physiology that's specifically responsive. I, I don't take that out of consideration, but it's a sort of a red flag if somebody says, I want this opioid only. Non-adherence with other recommended therapies. So if somebody, if I'm trying to use distraction treatment and I'm trying to, let's say I prescribe somebody acetaminophen and ibuprofen and some opiates on top, and I have them come back for a pill count, and all their opioids are gone, but they haven't touched their acetaminophen or their ibuprofen, that suggests to me that's an aberrant sort of behavior, because they're all part of what's prescribed, not just the opioids. And then running out early, unsanctioned dose escalation, or people that lose prescriptions all the time, um, suggests that somebody might be diverting them or doing funny things with them. And then there's things that are a little more serious than that. 
like people come in and they're over sedated or nodding, they're deteriorating in their function at home or work, they're not coming in for pill counts or participating in urine drug screenings if those are part of your office policies. Multiple lost or stolen prescriptions or forging prescriptions or selling opioid prescriptions. Those are all, I mean, those, that's illegal. And those are all um, sort of strongly aberrant behaviors. And the differential diagnosis, why somebody might do that, is that, well, they might have inadequate analgesia. Their, degrees might be, their disease might be progressing or they might be going into withdrawal because they're, uh, say, metabolizing the drug faster than usual. Or they have something called opioid-induced hyperalgesia, which is as your brain becomes accustomed to opioids, you actually have increased pain. It's sort of the worst because you sort of are taking opiates to reduce your pain and your brain response to the pain becomes even more sensitive. Or they could have an opiate disorder, or they have tolerance, or they're self-medicating a psychiatric or physical symptom, or that they have criminal intent. So those are all possibilities. The key principles of whether or not to prescribe somebody or continue to prescribe somebody an opioid depends on whether the benefits outweigh the harms. So it doesn't mean that there's certain people who can be on opiates or certain people who can't. Anyone that comes into the emergency room with, say, a, uh, an acute long bone fracture from a traumatic injury should get IV morphine, right, like to relieve their pain from my, from my perspective. That's an appropriate set and setting for a very painful injury to use an opioid medication. That's very different than here's a three-month supply of a high-dose long-acting opioid with four refills. Uh, good luck in your life, right? Those are really different contexts. I always judge the treatment and not the patient. So if uh, somebody, let's say, I'm going to go back a couple slides, is doing some of this stuff and it's enough of this stuff and let's say their cures shows things it shouldn't show, like they're going to get opiates from somebody else. And let's say I'm doing a urine drug screen and, and they're showing that they're using, say, benzodiazepines or other opioids that I'm not prescribing. Then I might say, look, it doesn't look like opiates are working out. I don't say it doesn't look like you're not working out. I don't judge the patient. I'm like, hey, I'm glad you're here. I'm thrilled that you're in treatment. But it doesn't look like opiates are going to be part of your treatment, right? Because it's just not working, right? Like, and, and I point out all of the things that aren't working. I don't have to prove that somebody's addicted. I just need to say that the risks associated with opiate use are not worth the potential benefits here. I emphasize how much I believe and empathize with pain. I don't ever, dis if somebody says in pain, I say, I get it, I hear you, I reflect, I, I offer reflection, you're in pain and that's awful. I express frustration that there's not a great pill that they can just take. Even if they say, but there's a great pill I can take, I can say, I don't agree. I don't agree because of these risk behaviors. I focus on the patient's strengths. You made it here today and you're somebody that clearly can get over adversity in your life. I encourage therapies for coping with pain. We might not be able to get the pain out uh, away right now, but here's the ways that we can help support your pain and show commitment to continue to caring about the patient, even if you're gonna taper them off opioids. I don't ever suggest um, like abruptly discontinuing opioids unless you're gonna send somebody right to an addiction treatment provider that can manage that. Um, but usually I say we're gonna ride out a taper and take you off of the opioids over time. And to schedule close follow-ups during an opioid taper um, and after the opioid taper is stopped. And a lot of what I know around prescribing pain comes from opioidprescribing.com, which uh, I'm not paid by. It is run by Dan Alford at Boston University. I would encourage you, they have um, dental specific slides on there, so I'd encourage you to go check that out. Um, this is the uh, CDC guidelines for prescribing opiates to chronic pain. For those of you that haven't, uh, well, didn't know the CDC had guidelines for pain, um, now you do. This is the CDC guidelines for pain, which is opioids are not first line that you establish and measure goals for pain and function. Um, one of the things that I would suggest is if you're treating somebody for pain, the focus is not on pain score. On a scale of zero to 10, how bad is your pain? I would focus on what are the functions that your pain is keeping you from doing? Can you chew? Can you swallow? Can you speak? Can you stick out your tongue? Can you move your teeth, right? Like th that's what I'm interested in, is what's the function of your mouth as opposed to that you're uncomfortable, right? Because that's something we can measure. I can listen to you talk this, or see whether you're um, like uh, productively dysarthric, right? Uh, related to, to say um, an, an antalgic, uh, say mouth. Um, I, can, I can look at your mouth's function and measure that, not totally objectively, but independently of a purely subjective report which is what a pain score is, purely subjective. There's no way of measuring it. I've had people sit perfectly comfortably with a pulse of like 60 and uh, you know, totally comfortable saying, I'm in excruciating pain. 
excruciating pain. And, and I'm like, I, there's no objective signs of that, right? Like there's no objective signs of 20 out of 10 pain. Uh, to discuss the benefits and risk of non-opiate therapies with patients, um, to, to use immediate release opiates when starting, start low and go slow. When opiates are needed for acute pain, prescribe no more than needed. Do not prescribe extended release or long acting opiates for acute pain or to kids. To follow up and reevaluate the risk of harm and reduce the dose or taper if needed. To evaluate risk factors for opioid related harms to check the prescription drug monitoring program. To use during drug testing to identify prescribed substances and undisclosed use, particularly in higher risk patients to don't prescribe benzodiazepines with opioids and to arrange treatment for opiate use disorder if needed. So this is what the CDC recommends. And if you're curious um, and you want more fact sheets, this is the uh, opioid prescribing guidelines and the assessing benefits and harms of opioid therapy, PDMPs, they have a bunch of fact sheets. Um, uh, if you go to CDC Drug Overdose Index, uh, you'll get a whole checklist for prescribing opiates. This is for chronic pain, so unless you're a dentist that sees a lot of chronic pain patients, you may not necessarily uh, notice this. But um, I'm going to go back a sli uh, two slides. When it says um, prescribe no more than needed, the CDC is actually pretty prescriptive. No more than needed from their perspective for acute pain is three days. and No more than a week. That's what they say. What I say is tailor the pain, the, the, the pain strategy to the patient. If you know that you've done, say, a major dental procedure that's likely to cause, an, uh, say, analgesia for 10 days, maybe you do five days with a refill, right? So you're not giving out the whole 10 days. You're, you're giving out less than a week at a time, but you're, but you're sort of metering it out uh, over time so that somebody doesn't, uh, say, you use everything that was prescribed all at the same time. Um, or to check in with the patient, maybe later in the week or early next week to make sure that they're responding appropriately to the pain regimen. Okay, uh, so is your practice prepared for a dental emergency? Um, so signs and symptoms of opiate abuse, small constricted pupils, losing consciousness or falling asleep, show solid breathing, choking, gurgling sounds, limp body, pale um, blue or cold skin. And so what happens if you find somebody, say near or in your office, or you, uh, you're trying to tell a parent what to expect if somebody has or is, this, is, uh, is suspected to have an overdose, is you call 911 imme immediately and administer naloxone. Naloxone is an antidote. It uh, blocks opiate receptors in the brain. Try to keep the person awake and breathing. Lay the person on his or her slide. Classic classically, it's the left side or left lateral position is the recommended uh, side to prevent choking and to stay with the person until emergency workers arrive. This is um, something that I've been seeing in more offices, including dental offices, is AEDs, which are automatic external defibrillators. Like if somebody's found down and has a heart attack, this will get their heart restarted. And on top of that is the opioid overdose Narcan kit. So the, kind of like where your AED is, right, you can uh, put your opioid overdose pack in case somebody is found down. Um, the opioid overdose packs, so you can buy a uh, nasal Narcan it comes in four milligram packs. Each pack comes with two, and the, the both cost about $75, right? That's what it retails for. Or you can buy a generic naloxone vial. This costs about a dollar. It's two milligrams instead of four, and it comes with an applicator and a nasal atomizer. Um, the way that the, so this works pretty straightforward. You put it up the nose and you squish it, right? You press it, and it, uh, issues a mist, and the mist coats the nasal mucosa. It's not, you're not inhaling it, you're not like inhaling the Narcan, but it's coating, coating the nasal mucosa and absorbed through the nose. Same thing here, right? You've got the generic vial, the applicator, and the nasal atomizer, and that also mists into the nose, and this whole thing costs about $3. Now keep in mind, it's, this is half the strength of that, and this has two, so you would need four of these to equal that, but this is still way cheaper than that is, for what it's worth. And then um, there is also the American Dental Association Practical Guides to Substance Use Disorders and Safe Prescribing, published by the American Dental Association. This is my email address. And if any of you are like, wow, learning more about be, uh, the behavioral conditions of dental patients and learning about substance use disorder treatment is of interest, the American Society of Addiction Medicine has an annual meeting. I'm actually the treasurer of ASAM, so I will be there in Orlando in April for those that like theme parks. Um, the California Society of Addiction Medicine will be in Anaheim this September, and the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, which um, got the grant to get me here, um, they're going to be in North San Diego in December. So for those of you that are interested in more, 
all of these meetings are open up to everybody. So it's open up to uh, physicians, dentists, nurses, uh, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, like, uh, you know, and any, any clinician that's interested more about addiction. I think I have about 20 minutes left. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And what questions do you have? The, the question was, uh, do we have a legal mandate if we notice opioid use disorder in a patient or maybe in a family member, right, um, to report or have a mandate that's equivalent to the legal mandate around op uh, child abuse? And the answer is no. There is no mandatory reporting equivalent for opioid use disorder or other substance use disorders as is exists for child abuse. So with child abuse, DCFS has a 24-hour number, right? You would call them and issue a report and write down in the chart, you know, who you spoke with and all of that. And that does not happen with opioid use disorder. That said, um, the state of California it, uh, is, you know, kind of all but doing that by saying things like anyone that's on any high-risk opioids or has any history of a substance use disorder, you have to prescribe Narcan to and make sure they know how to use it, which is not the same as issuing a report, right? There's no, like, state agency keeping track of children at risk, but it is suggesting, that law does basically say that anyone on any high-risk uh, uh, opioid regimen does have to be prescribed naloxone. Um, what I think is reasonable is, uh, is for anybody that uh, is at risk of an opioid use disorder um, is, is sort of offered naloxone. And there's a couple things about naloxone because it is a rescue medicine that are worth noting. So one, it is legal to prescribe Narcan or naloxone to people who aren't the patient. So let's say hypothetically, um, you're, I'm a primary care doctor and you're in my office, right? Or let's say I'm a better example. I'm a dentist and you're in my office for a dental procedure and you're like, uh, yeah, you know, everything's going great, but my son, he's got a really bad opiate addiction and you know, like we don't know where he is right now and I'm really scared and da da da. You can prescribe that person Narcan that they can go get paid for by their insurance company even if the identified patient isn't the person you're prescribing to. So it is legal, it is California law that you could prescribe Narcan to somebody even if the intended recipient of that Narcan is somebody's friend or family member. The other thing is pharmacists can also dispense Narcan without a prescription. They have to have a one hour training course, so not all pharmacists can do it, right? Yeah, they have to have done the one hour webinar. Um, uh, but they, so there's a big push towards making Narcan widely available in the community for people who are at risk. But that's different than calling DCFS or whatever the opiate addiction equivalent would be and reporting somebody. Um, so the question is what happens if the patient, the, the child who's been identified, is accessing opioids, say, from their parental, from some parental supplier, some parental source. Um, isn't that reportable as neglect or child abuse? And I would say, actually, yes. If you have information that the patient, the child in this case, is accessing substances of abuse, either facilitated by um, the parent or through ne parental neglect, or I'll even take it one step further, if the, the patient isn't using substances, but is reporting that their parent is using substances in their presence, so the parent is intoxicating themselves, even when the, when the child's present and impairing their ability to be a parent, those are both absolutely reasonable, reportable events. And I have, in many cases, parents in my office who I have very serious concerns about their capacity to be able to parent because of their uncontrolled uh, substance use, whether it's opiates or something else. And that is fully reportable. And I've, rep uh, and, and I've contacted these uh, several times um, for regarding parental impairment. And in those instances, DSFS always takes the report, right? They, 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 it's not something that they say, oh, this isn't relevant. If, if somebody's using substances or if the kid is at risk of using substances through parental neglect, that's absolutely reportable. That's absolutely reportable. Hey, thank you so much for your time and attention.